As I say, treating school children is very easy. Uh, they're rather compliant, I must say, uh, while they're at school. Um, but also, after they've taken one round of these uh, drugs, uh, they certainly feel better and they have no problem coming back next year. Now, where are we working? Well, uh, the six countries in red is where we started, uh, and that's sort of uh, pre-giving uh, what we can, if you like. Uh, Burundi and Rwanda uh, were, um, <coughs> were funded by an external donor, uh, whose funding has now stopped, which is why the Giving What We Can donor has taken over from Burundi. And with uh, the additional money that we've got coming in now, we're hoping to expand into uh, rather more difficult countries. Uh, for those of you who know Africa, you'll know uh, that Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Tanzania, Uganda, and Zambia are relatively easy uh, donors' favorites, if you like. But starting to work now in Zimbabwe, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and in Ethiopia, in Cote d'Ivoire and Liberia, uh, is nowhere near as easy. Uh, but we've actually started in the blue countries, in Cote d'Ivoire and Liberia last year, in Malawi and Mozambique. We uh, delivered our first treatments at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. So we've got quite, a, uh, quite a, um, an ambitious expansion plan. And in many of those countries, once we've got started with the pilot projects funded by the members of uh, Giving What We Can, we uh, then persuade the British government, bless them, to give us additional money on their aid program because we've been able to demonstrate just how cost effective these treatments are. So uh, during the last three or four years, we've been giving out uh, treatments to Burkina Faso, Niger, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, and to Yemen. Uh, the Yemen program is slightly separate. It's funded by the World Bank. And what we've promised uh, the British government with the money that they're giving us is that over the, next, uh, over the next four years, we'll deliver 75 million treatments of both praziquantel and albendazole in uh, these countries. But in each of these countries, we don't have enough to actually go to national coverage yet. And uh, finally, just a, a little bit of uh, pride uh, that for our work, apart from being recognized by giving what we can, we were recognized by the Queen as well who gave us the anniversary prize in 2008. So, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Mark, do you want to...? Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Delighted to be here. Um, <laughs> What an inspiring um, story that was. Um, I'm not sure why I'm more amazed by the, the cost effectiveness or the amazing array of unpronounceable words <laughs> in one presentation. Um, ah, <laughs> security alert. Quick on OK, there you go. So, uh, my name is Mark Williams, and I run something called Action for Happiness, which I will tell you about in a moment. And this evening, I'm going to talk about happiness, but also specifically in the context of giving. Um, delighted to be part of this giving what we can event and thought it would be re very relevant to link what we do back to the, the theme of the sea. Um, I can't take any credit for having set up Action for Happiness, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. Um, when I first came across the idea, it was just an idea in the heads of some pretty uh, inspiring and pioneering thinkers. Um, and I, was, I knew immediately I had to get involved. I was intrigued by this idea of creating a movement of people who are passionate about um, you know, trying to shift the focus of society to the stuff that really matters, the stuff that really creates happy, fulfilling lives for people. Um, but I was also intrigued when I came across the concept as to whether or not there were any other non-profits or charities already working in this space. So I went online to the oracle of the, of the non-profit world in the UK, the, the Charities Commission database, did a search for similar organisations, uh, and what came up on my screen were the words... Your search for happiness has produced no results. <laughs> um, so I'm going to hope to do slightly better than that this evening, and in particular show why I guess all, I believe that all of our searches for happiness should begin with the idea of giving and why that's so vital. Um, when we think about progress as a society, we tend to think about income, both individually and as a society. We think about money as being the, the best way of defining our success. This graph is just asking the question, does more money make us happier? 
and injury. Um, this graph is looking at measures of happiness in terms of life satisfaction on the vertical axis, um, GDP per capita, um, sort of average income along the, <coughs> the x-axis there, and each dot here, which I'm afraid you can't read, is a country. Um, so there's a few interesting things that come out of this for me. First of all, there is a very strong relationship between income and, and life satisfaction. Um, you know, at the lower levels of income, increasing that, that income does quite dramatically improve life satisfaction. That, of course, is why alleviating poverty in those areas most lacking in, in financial well-being is so vital. But actually what we see is a very interesting tailing off of that effect. So, um, you know, above a certain level of average income, um, there can be countries um, with similar levels of of well-being, but very different levels of income. You, know, you, can, you can double the income per capita and not necessarily improve average levels of life satisfaction. So that raises an interesting question about, you know, to what extent does growing our wealth continue to improve the quality of our lives? Um, and perhaps even more interesting than looking at across countries um, is the question of within a country. And this data comes from the US, but in fact there's very similar data where it exists from the UK. And this is now looking at measures of happiness over time. Um, so here we're looking at you know, dates back over the last 50 or 60 years. And what we can see is that as we've got something like three times wealthier on average, and of course there's a big dis question about the distribution of that, that wealth, um, but, but nevertheless a very significant increase in average wealth, um, we have at best flatlined in terms of measures of life satisfaction. If anything, we've actually tailed off over that period. So given the enormous amount of energy we put into growing the economy, politicians falling over themselves right now to get the economy moving again um, at all costs. It's, in, it's interesting and I think very challenging to note that you know, growing the economy so successfully over the last 50 years hasn't necessarily, or in fact hasn't, improved levels of, of life satisfaction. And really that's where action for happiness um, begins really. This idea that what we should actually be maximising is people's well-being, their, their, their overall sense of life being happy, fulfilling and, and going well. Um, and so what we're creating is a movement of people who believe in that idea. They believe that both politically, um, you know, the, the focus of our society should be much more than just growing the economy, but also individually that we can take action to be happier ourselves, but crucially we can do things to create a happier world around us through the way that we spend our money, the way that we treat each other, the way that we behave as a parent, as a, as a, you know, a manager in the workplace or a neighbour on the street. So what we're doing is a series of sort of practical projects to take Actually, what's an amazing array of knowledge we now have from science, from the neuroscience, from psychology, about what really leads to happy, fulfilling lives, and seeing how we can apply that in local communities, in schools, and in organisations of all kinds. Um, and we're very new as an organisation. We only launched last year, but we already have uh, over 20,000 members signed up from 100 plus different countries. So it's starting to grab people's attention. And, um, some might say at a time when, obviously, we're in a difficult economic situation, this is coming to the fore even more, but we would argue that th these issues have been present long before we got into our current financial predicament in the developed world. Um, we, we're backed by an amazing array of partner organisations that specialise in areas like mental health, children's wellbeing, um, community wellbeing, families, student life, uh, and various other things. And we also try to influence policy makers and decision makers because all the action we take in our communities and schools can make life happier. Of course, we also need politicians to measure the stuff that really matters. And as you probably know, the government in the UK is now measuring people's well-being for the first time, which is a great step forward. Uh, and of course, policy on health, policy on um, you know, international aid, policy on um, a whole range of factors, um, education in particular, has a, has a big impact to play here. So that's what we're all about, but what I really wanted to lead into was the idea of giving and how important that is. And what this is called is our 10 Keys to Happier, frame, happier Living. Uh, it's a framework that um, is derived entirely from empirical research, so it comes from um, measurements of you know, the, the factors that do affect and have been shown to affect people's happiness. Now, of course, there's no 10 commandments for happiness. We all, we all have our own things that, that bring, you know, bring fulfilment in life. Uh, but these have been shown to consistently... Um, be associated with, with increases in happiness. Now, I haven't got time to go through all ten of them. Um, there's lots more information on our website if you're interested, but actually top of our list quite intentionally is giving. There's an amazing array of evidence as to why giving is great for our well-being. And in fact, what I'm going to do now is just run through three particular points that strike me about giving and 
the links between giving and, and happiness. So first of all, caring for other people is actually hardwired into our nature in evolutionary terms. This, of course, is Charles Darwin. And I think when most people these days think about Darwin's natural selection theories, we tend to sort of read into it this idea that, you know, basically humans are br brutish, selfish, only interested in, you know, in, the, in natural selection terms, in, in, in um, survival of the fittest and other phrases like that. But in fact, um, we, we, kn we know um, from both Darwin's work and more recent research that there are two aspects to human nature. There is very much a, a sort of selfish, self-preservation instinct, but we also are hardwired to care about each other. There is a, a naturally altruistic aspect to our nature. And in fact, Darwin knew this as well. He's, he wrote in the 1870s, those communities which include the greatest number of the most sympathetic members flourish best and rear the greatest number of offspring. Um, and, and this, of course, was based on observations at the time, but we now have neuroscience that shows, for example, the existence of mirror neurons, the idea that when we see somebody else in pleasure or in pain, the same part of our brain fires and lights up as if we're experiencing that pleasure or pain ourselves, you know, evidence that we are really hardwired to, to care about the, the plight of others. And uh, this next bit of data always makes me smile, but it's a nice example, I think, of how that natural selection process, that care, you know, uh, wanting to select for characteristics and include generosity, kindness, and giving has, has played itself out. This is looking at characteristics that we, we have when choosing sexual partners. And I always, I always smile when I note that men tend to um, place greater emphasis than women on beauty. Women tend to place greater emphasis on financial prospects than men. But in fact, both sexes place greater emphasis on kindness as an attribute when choosing partners. So again, evidence that this has indeed become part of our our process of, of selection. Um, the second reason, though, is more about us ourselves. So, as I hinted at the start, and with the title of the talk, Doing Good Feels Good, there's an amazing way of evidence that when we do things for others which we hope has a benefit for them, there's very much a reciprocal benefit for each of us, I think the point that was being made at the introduction. Um, so again, looking at the, the neuroscience, we know that the areas of the brain that light up when we give to others are actually the same sort of pleasure centres in the brain as when we do things that are you know, sort of treats for ourselves, if you like. Um, but it's not just that doing good feels good, it's also actually very good for our physical health as well. There's evidence that giving actually can lead to effects that lower blood pressure and even evidence that it potentially slows down aspects of the ageing process. So giving could also be the route to not only a more enjoyable but potentially longer and healthier life as well. But, but thirdly, and, I, and perhaps most excitingly of all, generosity, the idea of giving, being kind, is actually very contagious. Um, this picture is, I don't know if any of you have seen the film, but it's taken from a film called Pay It Forward, um, which includes this concept that um, you know, if, if you do um, kind deeds for just three other people, um, but instead of asking for something in return, you encourage those people to then do the same for three others, that can have this incredible ripple effect. It was a storyline in a film, Actually, not a particularly good film. It had John Bon Jovi in it, um, but um, but but the concept is good, and in fact now backed up by um, by research looking at um, what they call a panel study, long-term um, uh, multi-year study across different social networks of people, and looking at how kind behaviour ripples through those social networks. Um, and in fact, th th that sort of behaviour can ripple through what they call three degrees of separation. I can affect my friend's friend's friend through my emotional behaviour for my generosity. Um, so I think those are all really important reasons why giving is so important. We're hardwired to give and care. When we give, it's good for us too. And also, that effect is contagious. When people see kind acts, when they witness generosity, that has a ripple effect. So I think not only being generous, but being able to be seen to be generous, not in an egocentric way, but in a way that causes others to want to emulate that is really important.